So now in this next flowchart, we're going to continue our discussion on learning and entitle the next flowchart Learning 2. And we're just going to remind ourselves what learning is all about. Learning is all about the idea of creating this link. And the link is specifically between both experience, which is the idea of learning itself, and then combining that experience with a known and well-established behavior. And that's just simply an action. An action plus an experience will give us a link, and we associate that with learning in animals. Another type of learning that we can understand through this idea of animal behavior is something called associative learning. And this is a very uh, psychology-driven type of learning that uh, many students have seen before in their psychology courses or maybe in an AP psychology course. Associative learning always creates an association, thus the name. We can look at the two major examples of this type of learning. Um, the first major example is called classical conditioning. So it's called classical conditioning. And we'll broadly define it right over underneath. So classical conditioning is the following. Classical conditioning can be considered um, the type of learning in which you have an association, of course, and this association is associated between two things. So associative learning, associated right here, between a normal physiological, this is a key word here, a normal physiological response, so we take a normal physiological response and associate that, create a learned effect with um, an unrelated stimulus. Unrelated stimulus. So there's that stimulus word again. Um, so we're taking an unrelated stimulus and pairing it with a physiological response to give us classical conditioning, thus associative learning. Best way to understand this is to look at Mr. Pavlov and Pavlov's dog specifically. Pavlov and his experiments in the 1900s played a big, big role in understanding classical conditioning. Pavlov did something very simple, yet very, very uh, intuitive, very, very uh, all, like changing in terms of the idea of how we understand uh, learning altogether. He stated and saw that if he took something like meat powder, so he took meat powder, and he gave this meat powder to dogs. He put it into the dog's mouth, allowed the dogs to eat this meat powder, so we'll say put into dog's mouth, and when he did that, the dogs naturally, out of a physiological response, um, were salivating. This triggers salivation in dogs. So there's our physiological response. Um, but our physiological response is nothing unless we associate it with an unrelated stimulus. So meat powder into a dog's mouth will create salivation. That's something obvious, right? You salivate when you start smelling food, when you start smelling something really, really, uh, it seems like that smells really delicious. So that same idea happens in dogs. That's a normal physiological response. But let's say when you do this uh, scenario right here, Pavlov did this. He rung a bell at the same time. Let's say he rings a random, unassociated, unrelated bell. That's a sound. That's a stimulus at same time. At the same time that he puts this meat powder into the mouths. And you know what he realized? He created an association. He created a learning event. He, he linked experience with behavior. Behavior, physiological response is our behavior. Our experience is this bell. And so what do we see? We see that if he rang the bell alone, without any meat whatsoever, without giving the dogs any meat, he just rang the bell. After a long, long time of doing this over and over and over again with the dogs, he noticed that the dogs salivated. That is a physiological response, but it's abnormal because it's in response to a bell ringing. It's not in response to meat, but it's in response to the bell alone. The dogs salivated without meat powder. Salivated without meat powder. This is always brought up in every single psychology course because it's such a 
clear cut and super, super relevant and easy to understand experiment that Dr. Pavlov was able to complete uh, utilizing the idea of classical conditioning. So instead of classical conditioning, there's another type of associative learning where we associate something with something else to create a link between experience and behavior, and also done by a very, very famous psychologist. And that type of learning is called operant conditioning. Operant conditioning. And we're going to do the same thing. We'll broadly define it right underneath and then work off of that definition. So in operant conditioning, an animal learns to associate behavior, so there's learning right there, animals learn to associate, and there's our key word here because we're learning about associative learning, no pun intended, animals learn to associate behavior with a reward, which he would call positive reinforcement, that's something to keep in mind, positive reinforcement. So you have learned to associate a behavior with a positive reinforcement, aka a reward, or with a punishment. Or punishment. And that punishment is just considered negative reinforcement. So I'll write that over here. Negative, N-E-G, I'll just write re-N-F. There we go. So that's a negative reinforcement, that's a punishment, it's called a negative reinforcement, and a positive reinforcement is a reward. This is otherwise known as trial and error learning. Trial and error learning. Sometimes you're going to get a reward, sometimes you're going to get a punishment, and that's how you learn. That's how you create an association, that's how you create a link. We're trying to associate a behavior right here with an experience. And what's our experience? Our experience is either getting a reward or a punishment, either getting positive or negative reinforcement. And so this was uh, mainly done and figured out all by Mr. B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner is a big, big, what we would call behaviorist. And he believed a lot in the idea that behavior was simply due to the fact that either you get a positive reinforcement or a negative reinforcement and that defines behavior. And he proved this through a study with a rat. He put a rat in a box, okay? So it's a very simple study, but very, very interesting. Put rat in box, and he put it with a lever, a specific lever. So the rat is in a box with a lever, and let's say the rat accidentally presses the lever. Just out of curiosity, rat has the ability, it has the physiological capability of pressing the lever. So it accidentally presses lever. And what happens is, upon this accident, food comes into the cage. Put Food comes into the box. This is called a Skinner box. And once the food comes into the box, we're, starting to, we're going to get an associative operant conditioning. We're going to get an, in a situation in which the rat is going to learn that this behavior of pushing a lever will cause a reward, will give me a reward that is a positive reinforcement, and thus B.F. Skinner noticed that the rat learns. It learns. That's the key here. That's what animal behavior is about right now. Rat learns to press lever to get food. Press lever to get food. And this works simply because the rat in a real life, you know, nature environment will never have a lever that it presses to get food. But what we've noticed is that it still will press something that it's never seen before, something totally random and out of its own world, and still recognize that, hey, I can get something important for my survival, such as food, through something that I've never seen before. I can undergo what he would call, of course, this is positive or negative, positive reinforcement. This is positive, positive sign, reinforcement. And finally, operant conditioning, just as sort of a side note, this is actually something used by animal trainers a whole lot. Used by animal trainers. There's lots of examples of both operant and classical conditioning in the animal worlds and even in the human worlds um, uh, based off of many different psychology experiments devoted to do these two realms of associative learning.